No, so it's Psalm, Psalm 12 there. The verses that I want you to see is down there at the bottom of the, of the, the psalm in verse 6 and 7. Verse 6 and 7, it says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. The sermon title this morning is Why We Are King James Only. Why We Are King James Bible Only. And so we just did a, a little uh, discussion on this this past Thursday with uh, me and some of my, my friends um, as far as uh, why we're King James only, why that's important. So I just wanted to preach that to, to you guys and kind of hit some big points as far as why we're King James only. So when you look at our statement of faith and it says we are King James only, there's a reason why that is and what do I mean by that as well. So uh, in this passage, what, what I want to first get across here is why would we even be King James only? What's the purpose of being King James only? The purpose is, is that we believe that God has preserved his word perfectly. Okay? Now, once you come to that conclusion, as far as Psalm 12 here, where it says that thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever, talking about his words, once you realize that, then you have to, real, then you have to think to yourself, where is it? Let's just be honest, okay? Let's say it's not the King James, but where is it? Okay? Did God preserve his words or not? Do we have every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God or do we not? Did God keep his promise or not? Now, you should come to the conclusion and say, yes, he did. Okay? If not, then why are we all here? Okay? This is our foundation. If the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? So, the foundation is the word of God. Now, once you come to that conclusion, now you've got to say, okay, where is it at? Okay? Let's say you have all these different Bibles that are out there all these different versions, which one's right? Are they all wrong, or is there one that's right? And here's the thing that you have to come to the conclusion, is that they can't all be right. If you have all these Bibles, and they're all saying something different, they all have different verses, and, they, and, and well, trust me, we're going to get to some of that, but when, when you come to that conclusion, you can't say they're all perfect and they're all God's Word because they're not all the same, Okay. And so once you come to that conclusion, I want to show you some verses on this as far as why, why we're King James only. I'll show you why it's King James, okay? But I want you to first realize that there is a perfect word of God out there somewhere, okay? Now, I, I personally believe it is the King James. And, uh, and I'm going to get into some of the false arguments people make, too, because some people think, well, then you're saying only English-speaking people can get saved, or you have to know English. No, that's not what I'm saying. We've never said that. That's what Ruckmanites say. Okay, and we're going to get into that. I believe the, the Word of God can be translated into every language, unless it's some, like, tongue-talking language, okay? Now, it's got to be a real language, okay, for me to say that it's going to be translated into it. Um, but anyway, uh, go to Psalm 19. You're in Psalm 12. Go to Psalm 19. I want to show you some verses as far as what the Bible says about this issue first. And then we'll get into the King James debate as far as is the King James Bible perfect or uh, can it be perfect kind of thing. But Psalm 19 and verse 7, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The, the, the sta statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Go to Psalm 119. What you'll see here is that it keeps saying the law of the Lord is perfect, his commandment is pure. The thing that you keep seeing is pure, 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 pure. Pure meaning that there's, there's nothing that's, that's uh, corrupt in it. Okay? it you know, when we say the word pure, we're not talking about the, what we would think as being pure. Okay? Uh, the words of the Lord are pure words, and the Bible says that the commandment of the Lord is pure. Notice what it says in Psalm 119, verse 140. 140. So Psalm 119, verse 140, it says, Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. So not only is it pure, but it's very pure. Okay. Uh, go back a few verses to verse 89. It says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, this is kind of another topic, but it comes to the fact that God's word has always been. It's always been in heaven. 
But holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It says the scripture came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We have a more sure word of prophecy now. But the Holy Ghost spake these words through men. But those words were already there. You know, it, it's not like it just came to be. Okay, God, obviously Jesus Christ is the word. And he's from everlasting to everlasting. But all that to say is that his word has always been and it always will be. And to say that it, it fell away or that, you know, it was here in the originals, but now it's gone is ludicrous. Okay, it's to deny all these scriptures that, that the word is perfect, it's pure, it's preserved from this generation forever. You either believe that or you don't. Now, in, in Proverbs 30, uh, Proverbs 30, I just want you to see that it's talking about the word of God. It's pure. It's incorruptible. So Proverbs 30 and verse 5, Proverbs 30 and verse 5, notice what it says. It says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So now he's putting a punishment on those that would add to his word. But notice that his word is pure. It's being brought up very, very pure. And I go to Matthew chapter 5. Let's see what Jesus had to say about the word of God as far as uh, what, uh, whether it's going to pass away, whether it can fall to the wayside. <clears throat> this is very important to understand this because this is why we're King James only and why we don't believe that for 400 years or for 300 years until the new versions came out, we just didn't have the word of God. That's what you have to come to if you're going to say that the new versions are the word of God, but the King James it isn't. Or that there was errors in the King James, or there was problems with the King James until the new versions came. You have to say that there was about a 300-year gap between when we had God's word and when we didn't. And so, uh, but, but in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, notice what it says. Matthew 5 and verse 17, Jesus is talking here. It says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. But verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Not one jot or one tittle. What are you talking about there? You're talking about even the punctuation. Now, again, I'm going to get into this because languages are different and the way alphabets are different. And, and all that stuff, and punctuations change depending on what language you're in. So when it's saying that, it's not saying that the punctuation that was in the Greek needs to be in the English, okay? What that means is that punctuation is, is essential for you to, to be able to read and understand what's, what's being said. Does that make sense? You have to have periods, you have to have question marks, you have to have all that type of stuff. And what that means is that if there is something that's a question in the Hebrew, it's going to be a question when it's translated in English for it to be preserved. Does that make sense? So that's where you're talking about the jot and tittle. Because what we don't believe is that it needs to be word for word, like literally translating Greek to, to English or Hebrew to English because it's not going to sound, it's not going to make sense. Okay? Um, so that's, that's where you throw it into Google Translate and see what happens. Okay? Because that's, it's not going to be good. Okay? Anybody that knows about different languages or if you tried to speak Spanish, and I've studied you know, Greek and stuff like that, um, and so I've, you know, you understand that you can't do that. Just even the way they structure sentences in different languages is different, right? Even in Spanish, you think about that, right? The way they structure is kind of opposite of the way we structure. We always put the adjectives first. They put the adjectives afterwards, stuff like that. Um, and so uh, they kind of start off with the subject or the object, and then they kind of add on everything that goes with it. So um, this isn't an English lesson, but what I'm saying here is that the jot and tittle is talking about that type of stuff. So even not just the words, but the punctuation that goes with it, that would be associated with the meaning that's going behind the words, right? And then go to Matthew 24. Now this, the, Matthew 24 and verse 35 is in uh, the other Gospels as well, in Mark 13 and Luke 21. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read it. It's the same verse, but just know that this is mentioned other times as well. So anytime something's repeated in the Bible... Take note that it's important, especially if it's word for word repeated. In uh, Matthew 24, verse 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. That's your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ saying that. 
Heaven and earth are going to pass before his words pass away. And the reason we're King James only is because we believe there's been an unbroken chain of the word of God since the foundation of the world. Meaning that, and obviously we have a more sure word of prophecy, meaning that God has been, you know, with the prophets, he was adding on books and, and stuff like that. And with the apostles, it ended with that, as far as the, the, the apostles were the last. The, the, the word of God was built on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles. And so, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. And the apostles were the last to see Jesus after his resurrection, which means no one's getting open visions today from the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you're an apostle, but Paul said that he was the last. So, all that to say is that the Word of God is complete. It's, it's done, meaning that we're not getting new revelations. We're not getting, like, more books to add to this. But that is not going to pass away. Now, go to uh, Matthew 4. You're in Matthew 24. Go to Matthew 4. And this is what it really comes down to. Jesus said that not one jot or one tittle shall fail or shall pass. And he says, my words shall not pass away. As much as, you know, he's basically saying heaven and earth is not going to pass away, then my words aren't going to pass away. Heaven and earth is going to pass away before that happens, is what he's saying, right? But Matthew 4, in verse 4, this is why we, we believe that we have to have a perfect word of God, or this is a lie right here. Or God's commanding us something to do that we can't do. Because in Matthew 4, in verse 4, it says, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Every word. Luke says the same thing. It just says that by, by every word of God. This is quoted in Deuteronomy, where it says that uh, about every word that proceeded out of the mouth of uh, the Lord shall men live. So this is something, it's not like it's just in the New Testament that's saying this. It was saying it back in Moses' day as well. And so if God's commanding us to live by every word of God, but we don't have it, how can you do that? Remember that God's commandments are not grievous, Okay. And people that, that attack the King James Bible or attack the fact that we're King James only, they literally believe that you have to go back to the Greek and Hebrew, and even then, you don't have the perfect, you don't know if that's even correct completely. So you've got to play Indiana Jones, and you've got to go, like, find the fragments, and you've got to go searching for all this stuff to try to find out where the Word of God is at. Listen, who here believes that God put His Word underneath a rock for any period of time? I don't believe that for one second. I believe his word, you know, especially since Jesus' day, has been available. Now, back when Jesus wrote the Bible, or when Jesus wrote, when, when the apostles and all those that penned down the Bible, uh, as far as, you know, they were moved by the Holy Ghost, uh, it was in Greek. English wasn't a language by then, okay? It wasn't a language until later on. And so, uh, we're not saying that English is God's language, okay? That's where people get into the weeds. And, and when I say I'm King James only, I'm not saying, like, English only. Does that make sense? That's what people hear, though. When you say King James only, they say English only. I'm saying King James only in our language. Okay? So if, you're in, if you speak Spanish, then get the Reign of Valera Antigua or the Reign of Valera Gomez and, you know, go, go for it. Uh, Brother Jeff was telling me about the, the Pope version. It had nothing to do with the Pope, Catholic Pope, but uh, for Thai. And uh, his wife's from Thailand. And she's been reading through it and obviously reading the King James, too, and, and basically saying it's, it's, it's right on. And so, obviously, there's other versions, you know, uh, that, that are right there with the King James that are in other languages. Okay, so we're not saying that, like, only English, and if you don't know English, you can't get saved. Okay, that's, that's hogwash. That's a straw man. A straw man argument is where they, they take this argument that you don't believe, and then they start beating it to death, and then they destroy that argument, and then they're like, aha, we beat you. And it's like, no, I didn't believe that, so burn that thing. Uh, so we don't believe that. What we do believe is that, that the King James is perfect in our language and that there's no error, okay? There's not one single error in the King James Bible, okay? And uh, this is important. I'm going to get to the real big reason why this is important. This is a heaven or hell issue, Okay? as far as the, the Word of God. The Word of God is a heaven and hell issue. And when, when you're, if you spoke Spanish, then you better try to, and that's all you speak, you need to find out where your, your Word of God is at. If you speak Greek, for example, 
they need to find where you're now luckily it's already in greek right that's what they wrote it in and so um and uh, you know the scholars are like well the coin hey greek that's different that's a whole different language hogwash it is not a different language i'm learning modern greek and i'm reading a, a coin a greek new testament and yes there's some words that are a little different but mostly it's the exact same thing it's just as much when you're reading the King James Bible and you speak contemporary English, and this is in modern English, and there's some words in there that you have to like think about, like, what is that saying? Like, you're not used to putting the TH on the end of things. You're not used to saying thou and ye. That's the difference that you're dealing with between what the Greek that, that, that our, our, New Test, our New Testament was translated from and what the Greeks are using today. Okay, and so all that to say is that go to, go to Acts chapter 2 because that's, that's the false argument. And they'll say, well, you King James only guys, you're putting God in a box. No, we're not, actually. You're putting God in a box by saying you have to learn Hebrew and Greek. Because that's what it comes down to with these new version people. Okay? It all comes down to the fact that you need to go back to the Greek and Hebrew, and none of them will say that the NIV, ESV, New King James, any of these other NLT, whatever these versions are, none of them will say that they're perfect. None of them will say that. So, what does that mean? You have to either learn Greek and Hebrew, or you need to go to them for your answer. And that's what it comes down to, my friend, is that they want to be the authority. They want to be God. And so, anytime you have a church where you have to come to the pastor, and you can't learn it on your own, that's dangerous. That's where you get into cults, okay? Anything that I'm preaching up here, you can look for yourself, and you can see it in the Bible, black and white, and, and listen, you ought to be looking at your Bible and saying, is what he's saying true? No one should just be blindly following what I teach. That's why I try to put a lot of Bible in this, because I want you to know that this is why I believe this from the Bible. And even if I do have a lot of Bible, you may say, well, you know, I see where he's coming from, but I don't agree. I think this is what it is in the Bible. That's the way you should be looking at it. Okay? And so, but with these new versions... Their whole prerogative is to put you in, put God in a box to say, no, God only speaks Greek and Hebrew. And it can't be perfectly in English. You know, the person that says that there's always something lost in translation probably doesn't speak any languages besides their one language. You know, these people always say that. I'm tired of people saying that because most people that you talk to that are bilingual will say, say to you that's hogwash. And so, you know, there's obviously idioms in, in, in English. And there's idioms in other languages. And you say, what's an idiom? Not an idiot, an idiom. <laughs> okay. An idiom is like this. If I said it's raining cats and dogs outside. Now, if you said that and you translated that into another language, it'd be like, what in the world are you talking about? Like, are there little felines and dogs, rovers falling out of the sky? That's an idiom. Okay. It's, a, it's an expression of speech, right, that we would use that's known in a, in a culture or society. You may even say that in England, and they'd be like, what in the world are you talking about? They could even understand what you're saying, but an idiom is something like that, okay? So there's things like that where they were translating the Greek to the, to the New Te into the English, and there's idioms that are used in Greek that if you translated it literally what their idiom is, it wouldn't make sense to us, okay? But does that mean they can't be perfectly translated, meaning that you can use a different idiom that we would use? You know, that's what we're talking about here. So I'm just preparing you for the James Whites out there, okay? This is a little deeper than maybe you'd be used to. You know, this isn't just like, hey, let me show you all the new versions. I'm I, I want you to know that these are the types of arguments that, like, James White, who wrote a whole book against King James Onlyism, and what they're going to use. And by the way, these people that write these books like James White, they're a bunch of morons, Okay, they want to act like they're these Greek scholars and they know all this stuff. This guy, and I, I mentioned this in our discussion, this guy came out and said, you know, the King James, this is the only arguments they can use against King James. Is there, it's archaic. You know, the words are archaic and all that stuff. They can never really point to, like, here's a contradiction, here's a problem, or anything like that. They're always just saying, no, you know, it's just archaic. You need this, this new contemporary English. And he said this. He's like, you know, there's these words in there that are just... It's just archaic, you know, like, um, like, uh, like uh, I'm going to say the way he says it, okay? Because he mispronounces the way he says it. Like, choler and a doe. Now, anybody that's listening to me would probably be like, yeah, what in the world is that? But what if I said collar, like C-H-O-L-E-R? 
You know, you think of someone that's choleric, right? They're angry. I don't know if that's where colic comes from, but it makes sense, right? You know, like babies that have colic. Uh, I haven't looked that one up, but uh, babies that have colic are very angry, right? At least mine are. Um, but all that say, then a doe, it's a do. Have you ever heard, you know, you know, a bunch of do over nothing or, you know, uh, no further ado? You probably heard that before. With no further ado, I present to you so-and-so. That's, that's the words he was saying, but he was mispronouncing them. And I don't, he's either doing it on purpose to be a devil or he's an idiot. I'm going to go with both. Okay, so all that to say is that these people that, you know, the, the, the Chucky Schwindals and, you know, the, these people that, that, that claim to be Greek scholars, most of the time, they only know how to maybe even read it. And it's going to be that bastardized, Americanized way of reading it, by the way. It's not going to be the actual way. A Greek speaker would look at them like they're an idiot if they, if they spoke to them like that. But they're either going to probably just know how to read it and look it up in a Greek concordance. They're not going to actually be able to read it like you would read in English right now. Okay? And so all that to say is that these people, most of them are that way. I'm not saying there isn't somebody out there that knows Greek and Hebrew. Okay? There are people out there that know Greek and Hebrew and can read it and all that fun stuff. Right? But all that to say is that most of these people, and especially most Baptist preachers, most Baptist preachers that claim to be Greek scholars don't know a lick of it. If I said to them, kata la venete alini ka, they'd probably look at me like I had three heads. You know, because they don't know a, a word of it. And by, by the way, I'm speaking that in modern Greek, and the way they would actually speak is so they definitely wouldn't know what I was saying. But all that to say is that these people, the whole reason that they're not King James is they want authority that doesn't belong to them. This is where your authority should lie. Now, obviously, I have authority in the church as the pastor as far as, you know, uh, trying to hone, you know, make sure that false doctrines aren't in here. I, I'm not lording over the flock, but I'm watching over the flock, and I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm the, I'm the under-shepherd. Jesus Christ is the chief shepherd, and he's the head of the church. And by the way, he's the word of God. So that's who the real head is here. When you go to these churches that don't, uh, that don't have the King James or don't have a perfect version that they're going to, listen, I would at least respect them if they said, we're using the NIV, we believe it's perfect, there's no error in it. And that's our final authority. I would respect them for that. I would say they're wrong, and they're going to get into a lot of false doctrine, but at least that is respectable. But none of them say that. So the only conclusion I can come to is that at some point you have to, you're just taking what they're saying as being gospel truth. Now go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 5. I want to prove to you that God's word can be translated into every language. Case in point is the New Testament. Do you know that most of New, a lot of the New Testament, if not most of the New Testament, is a quotation of the Old Testament? So when the, the apostles were writing it down in Greek, you know what they were doing? Writing down a translation of the Old Testament in Hebrew. Case in point. So do you not believe that the Greek is, is a perfect translation? So that alone should tell you that it can be done. And to say that God only speaks Greek and Hebrew is ridiculous. Okay, that's where you're putting them into a box. But in, in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to prove to you that God can, can get his word across in any language. That should be known. By the way, yeah, that's the, that's the, <laughs> the rumbling I'm talking about up in the, the roof there. Uh, but Acts chapter 2, verse 5, it says, And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Notice, now if you doubt that, that it says like every nation under heaven, it's going to go through a list here. In verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia and in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So it's just like, here, let me give you a whole list of countries that were there as far as all the languages that were spoken. So don't give me this garbage that it can't be translated into another language. That's, that's just unbiblical. Biblical. 
you had to have to say that the Greek New Testament would have errors. Because there's just multitudes and multitudes. I mean, the book of Psalms is quoted mostly in the New Testament. I mean, you look at these, especially the epistles and stuff like that. But it, how many times is it? It is written. It is written. It was spoken by this prophet. It was said by this prophet. It was said this. You know, over and over and over again. Most of Jesus' sermons is like, have you not read? It is written. And he goes on and quotes it off. And sometimes, guess what? It was Aramaic, too, that they were saying. So, like, Cephas is an Aramaic term. And a lot of times when it say, like, uh, Tab- uh, Tabitha Kumai or uh, Ephatha, you know, when Jesus would say certain words, those were in Aramaic, and they were transliterated into Greek when they wrote the Greek New Testament. But it's the Word of God. And so, and even some, you know, to get into the real deep, but uh, some of Daniel was in Aramaic as well. You know, like the Syriac tongue and all that stuff. And, and by the way, you know, think of this. When Paul, and I'm just thinking this all the time, when Paul was speaking to the people that wanted to kill him, I think it's in Acts chapter 21, going into 22, they wanted to kill him, and it says that he spoke to them in the Hebrew tongue. But what was written in, the, in, in Acts chapter 22? Greek. So when he was speaking, what was he speaking? Hebrew. And what was written in the Bible? Greek. So this whole idea that it can't be translated is just a, it's, it's a farce. It's just not true. Uh, the Bible completely uh, destroys that argument. But you say, well, you know, why the King James? Well, first of all, you've got to think about, well, who's been evangelizing the world? Right? Because when you look at, obviously in Jesus' day, what was the main language back then. Well, you think about this, okay? The Roman Empire was the empire back then, right? What was the empire before that? The Grecian or the Greek, the Greek Empire. The Greek Empire was before that, so is it any marvel that Greek was a main language, okay? Now, what was written on Jesus' cross? You know, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. What, was it, what languages was it written in? Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, Aramaic. I'm getting that from Mike. We were doing the Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. Do you know Latin was even back then? Now, Latin was more of the Roman language, but why was Greek on there? You know, Hebrew makes sense because you're dealing with Judea and people that speak Hebrew, right? Then, then you think Latin makes sense because it's Romans, but why was Greek on there? The same re- reason that English is on it most everything when you go around the world. When you go into other countries, they'll still have English on stuff. And most countries are speaking bilingual. They, English is the number one language in the world today. And so uh, you, you think to yourself, well, why, why did they put it in Greek? Why didn't he put it in Hebrew? Most of the, a lot of the apostles were Jews, right? Paul the apostle was, was born a Jew, right? Why didn't he put it? He could obviously speak Hebrew. It says he spoke Hebrew. Why didn't they put it in Hebrew? Because that wasn't the main language back then. And they were going, obviously, to the whole world. So they put it in Greek. How, do you think that they just learned Greek to write it? Just, I'm just wanting you to think logically here. Do you think that they took Greek glasses, classes and they learned Greek before they penned down, like, the book of Matthew, the book of Mark? And before, they, before Luke penned down the book of uh, Luke and Acts, do you think that they took classes on that, or do you think they already knew it? Because if you're going to write down, if you're going to do a dictation of something, what language are you going to probably do it in? The language you know the best. Or at least the language you know that's going to reach the most people. And so I believe that the apostles, you know, knew these languages. And obviously, if you're going to evangelize the you know, Greek-speaking people and all that stuff, how in the world are you going to do it without uh, knowing the language? That's why I keep saying to the Jew first and also to the what? Greek or the Gentile, okay? Now, all that to say is just, that's just some logical reasons as far as back in Jesus' day, Greek was the main language that was throughout the world. That was like the Kurt Blanche, like most everybody spoke Greek, but if you were, in, if you were a Roman, you probably knew Latin, and if you were in Judea, you probably knew Hebrew, right? Everybody knew Greek. They're the same thing. What today is the number one language? Is it a marvel that the King James Bible has been used for over 400 years to evangelize the world? 
Who's evangelizing the world today? Is it Greece? Now, is the Greek New Testament wrong? No. Obviously, it's still right. But is Greece evangelizing? Is Israel evangelizing the world right now with the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's laughable. I'd definitely be on Greece's uh, team before I'd be on Israel's team as far as who's evangelizing the world. No. Obviously, America has been evangelizing the world for, you know, for the past a couple hundred years. But even before that, it was England and English-speaking people, okay? And so, and, you know, I'm not saying that there, there wasn't Latin, you know, people preaching the gospel in Latin and doing all this other stuff. But it was Greek for a while there. It was Greek for a while. And so, all that to say is that for 400 years, so I'm going to take the Bible that's been tried and true. Does that make sense? Like, if you're going to say, well, which one should I choose? Probably the one that's been around the longest as far as, like, it's been tested, it's been tried. And so why would you be looking for one that hasn't? This is where it comes into, you know, people would say to me, well, what about this 21st century King James Bible, okay? And listen, I'm not saying that, that a King James Bible couldn't be put into more contemporary English, meaning where you, you uh, take off the THs at the end, you put S's, or you take hath and make has instead of hath and stuff like that. I'm not saying that would be wrong. I'm not saying that wouldn't be the word of God. That's another false argument, by the way. <laughs> okay? I'm not saying if you modernize the way we speak today or you change the spelling. If you, if you take the K off music in the, in the King James or you take the U's out of a lot of the like, color and just that different uh, words that, that are in there, that's not, that's not changing the word of God. Okay? That's just spelling. That's what changed from 1611 to 1769. Son used to be S-O-N-N-E, like my son, you know, or the son of God was S-O-N-N-E. Plus the font was different. The S looked like an F, okay? And so all that to say is that, yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with modernizing, but I would worry. I would, I would be very leery of that because how do you know they didn't change something else? You say, well, would they be nefarious? Well, hundreds of Bibles are being written to be nefarious, you know, to make money. I'd, I'd look, first of all, is there a copyright on that thing? Because they have to be 10% different then. Or 10 or 20% different to keep their copyright. So that's something you have to think about. Uh, go to Romans chapter 10. Why is this important? Why is this a big issue? Why is this something where you're, you say, well, why do you make a big issue about that? Well, first of all, where's your authority? Is it in the pastor? Is it in the, the, the person you know, preaching? Or is it in the book that you hold in your hand? If you don't have a perfect word of God, then it's in, it's in a man. Plain and simple. And you say, well, I, I don't trust the person that I'm hearing it from. Then you're trusting yourself. Is that who you want to put your trust in? You know, the way of, uh, it, it says, uh, I'm misquoting it, but in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You don't want to trust in your own heart. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, the Bible says. So it says in Proverbs. So you don't want to trust in your heart. You don't want to trust in your own feelings. You don't want to trust in your own self. You need to just, you need to have a rock to hold on to, okay? There's many times that I found out I was wrong about stuff from the Bible. And I was like, well, that seemed right. But that's not what the Bible teaches. But why is this important? Because I do not believe people are getting saved from these new versions. Now, this is something that is, is not popular, okay? But what does it mean to be King James only? That's what it means. It means it's the only Bible we use. It's our final authority. There's no error in it. We believe that people can't get saved with these other versions. Caveat, I'm not talking about the versions that pre preceded the King James, meaning like there was other, English, like the Tyndale version. I have a Tyndale in here if you want to look at it later. It says the same exact thing. Um, the Bishop's Bible and all that stuff. They all came from the same Greek text, though. And they all pretty much say the same exact thing. And it's just more so of like honing it in, you know, being more poetic, making sure you got all the little uh, uh, corks out of it and stuff like that as far as the King James goes. All of these new versions are using other texts. Even the new King James veers off from, from the Textus Receptus when it comes to the Greek text. And so uh, I don't believe people are getting saved from these, these corrupt versions. And so why is that important? Because in Romans 10 there, notice what it says. Romans 10 and verse 16, I want you to see this first of all, because we're talking about the gospel. We're talking about salvation. Romans 10 verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? 
Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. By the way, that's that, that quotation in verse 18 is from Psalm 19, talking about the word of God, and it's going throughout the whole world. And this is talking about in the past, because you're talking about Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, when he said, Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And so, in this passage, it says, So faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. This is something that's baffling to me, especially in Baptist churches, where people believe that someone can get saved without the Word of God. Why don't you just say you can't get saved without Jesus? Because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Why don't you just say you don't need Jesus? Oh, by the way, that's where it goes to. They'll say you don't even need to know the name of Jesus. And then you get, this is why we're not Ruckmanites. Okay, the Ruktars, and people are like, who's Ruckman? Don't worry about it. He's dead now anyway. But Peter Ruckman is this guy that people went to him for the King James because, you know, they wanted the, like, a defense for the King James Bible. This guy believed that the King James Bible was better than the originals. You know what that means? Is that that's extra biblical, you know, uh, revelation. Right? How could you be better unless God, like, gave you more information you know, than what the originals were. We don't believe that it's better than the originals. We just believe it's just as good, right? It's, just, it's the same. It's just in a different language, okay? But Peter Ruckman, you know, uh, these, the, the Ruckmanites, the people that follow this guy, like Bill Grady, he believes that people can right now get saved by their conscience. Don't even need no name Jesus. Don't need the word of God. You know, they can just look up in the sky and say, you know, I know that, that murder's wrong, you know, and get saved. Okay, no marvel these people that believe in dispensationalism that think you, that people got saved by the law in the Old Testament or they got saved by their conscience in another, in another dispensation. Now, the gospel's always been the same and it's always been by faith and it's always been by hearing the word of God. So, go to, go to uh, Ephesians chapter 1. I'm just going to show you some of these passages. This is why it's important, because if you don't have the Word of God, then people aren't getting saved. And especially if you're in a soul-winning church, you better know that you have the Word of God, because now you're just spinning your wheels. You know, when it talks about, uh, you know, that song we sang, No Turning Back, Though None Go With Me, No Turning Back, Still I Will Follow, and, you know, I have decided to follow Jesus. You know, why do you... I can't imagine not having a perfect word of God to fall back on. I would turn back. Because I don't have something to trust into. Especially when persecution and trials come. You know, let's say you know, they, they persecute you for what you preach out of the Bible. And you say, well, there are mistakes in it. It's like, well, how do you know that's not a mistake then? That's the logic you have to use. If this is not perfect, how do you know salvation is the part that's wrong? How do you know... what what? Are you just going to pick and choose what's right? No, it's all right. And that's where you have to figure out, okay, what does it all mean? Okay. No marvel, by the way, that, that people that believe that the King James Bible is perfect end up having the best doctrine out there. They end up winning more people to Christ than anybody else. They're always living more separated than anybody else. They're not a bunch of crazy people that are following, uh, you know, people into uh, some homestead somewhere like... Uh, those camps, what, what am I thinking about? You know, like where they drink the Kool-Aid and all that stuff, and they're following some guy, Jim Jones, you know, like where, the, the Georgetown. Because they're following a man, they don't have the word of God, they don't have that rock, so they're leaning on men, okay? That's what the Ruckmanites are, by the way. Andrew Sluter, Bill Grady, all these people. They'd drink the Kool-Aid if Ruckman gave it to them. They would. They would, they would, they would drink it. But Ephesians chapter 1, notice what it says in verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. It says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So notice the progression of salvation. We saw it in Romans chapter 10, right? It says, How shall they hear without a preacher, and how shall they preach except to be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of him that preaches the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's, a, there's the progression, right? You send a preacher, they give you the word of God, you hear it, you believe it, you call on the name of the Lord, salvation. That's, that's the progression. 
Don't take out the, the crucial part, though, of the Word of God. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is a great passage, too, to show you that, <clears throat> that we believe that this is inspired. Okay? This is where the Jack Scott peop, you know, guys from like Hiles Anderson, where they were, they were against the Ruckmanites that be believe in double inspiration, meaning that the translators of the King James, like God was inspiring them and all that. We don't believe that. Okay? I don't even believe that some of the translators were even saved. Okay? We just believe that God preserved his word. Okay? But all that to say is that we don't believe in double inspiration. But we don't go over here where we don't believe that it's inspired. Okay? And they'll say, well, it's preserved. It's complete because it's like the whole 66 books and we have all this stuff. But it's not inspired. Because what their definition of inspired is, is the moment that like, the Holy Ghost spake through that person. Well, if that's the case, then the original autographs are the only ones that were inspired. And that fell away long ago, right? Because even the, 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 where we got the Greek text and all that stuff, it was, not, it was like in the 1200s. You know, it was in the 13th century that that was even found, you know, that, that, that they were working with to translate the King James Bible. So the original autographs were long gone. So were those not inspired, even the Greek? If I showed you my Greek New Testament, are you saying that's not inspired? Because that's what they'd have to say. But all that to say is that this passage here is showing us that his word is inspired. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, it says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So notice how what's making them wise unto salvation? The holy scriptures. Notice in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. If you don't have an inspired word of God in front of you, then how can, all this, how can you do all this? How can you be profitable in doctrine and reproof? How can you be a man of God that's truly furnished unto all good works if you don't have an inspired word of God? What's inspired even mean? Well, think about this. What does it mean to expire? Right? What does expire mean? It means it's done, it's dead, right? Like, you know, we, we, we would think like an expiration date, right? Well, inspire is the opposite of that. It means it's alive, okay? You think of inhaling or exhaling, like inspiration, expiration. Like, you, you think about inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. It has to do with breathing, okay, by the way. Same thing with spirit, same, all these words kind of deal with that. So when, when we're talking about it being inspired, what we mean is that it's alive. It's not dead. Oh, wait, I think I remember reading that. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharp and any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrows and the discerner of the thought and, thoughts and intents of the heart. By the way, quick means alive. He's going to judge the quick and the dead. So the word of God is quick. It's It's alive. That's what we mean by inspired, okay? We don't mean that the, the Holy Ghost came down on those translators and they were, like, were inspired to translate it. That's not what we're saying. What we believe is, though, that, that that's a perfect translation and the inspiration went with it. Does that make sense? So it's not like it's doubly inspired. But James chapter 1, just to show you, go to, go to first, uh, first Peter, actually. Go to First Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read James chapter 1. In verse 18 says, Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Again, by, with the word of truth. You can't take this piece out. And listen, if you're giving the gospel to children, you need to give them the word of God. And you say, well, they can't understand the word of God. Then they're not ready to get saved. They don't even need to get saved yet if they can't even understand it. Right? We talk about the knowledge of good and evil and how children have to even come to the, 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 the realization that they've even sinned. If they can't come to that realization and they don't understand it, they're not ready to get saved. This wordless book that they use and all this stuff, you're not going to get people saved that way. And why do you think that there's a bunch of apostate Christians coming out of Baptist churches today? It's because they've been using the wordless book, they've been watering down the gospel, they don't go through eternal security, and they just pray with them, and then they think they're saved until they're older, and then they become reprobate a lot of times too. And so this is an important issue. Because this issue is why a lot of false conversions come out of Baptist churches, because they're not using the Bible. And more importantly, they're not using the King James Bible nowadays. 
You know, the Baptist churches are getting rid of that. Listen, Pastor Polka Dot out there in Tempe and all this, the new independent Baptists, you know, as I take off the fundamental, because we're, we're the new IFB. We're the real IFB. But they're the, they're the ones that are, that are from the old IFB that are coming out. They're wearing skinny jeans. They're wearing polka dotted shirts. They're, they're, they're taking Baptists off their name. Listen, he calls his church City Point Baptist Church, but on his website, it's just City Point. And then when you, when you Baptist Church is like the little letters. I know it's a little bit smaller than Mountain, but that's not that much smaller, okay? I don't think anybody came in here and be like, didn't see the Baptist that's in our name, okay? And they're just a step away from getting rid of the King James. Listen, when you're sitting on bar stools, when you got purple lights behind you, you're wearing skinny jeans, wearing a polka dotted shirt. I mean, I don't even want you to have the King James Bible. I don't want to be associated with you. You might as well just go full war, get your glass pulpit, and, and you know, it, it's just unbelievable to me. But in Second, uh, in uh, First Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, and it's baffling to me that people that argue that you don't need the Bible to get saved that you don't need the Word of God to get saved because it goes against so many scriptures in the Bible. I'm not showing you all of them. I'm just showing you some of the, the ones that are the, the, the real clear ones that I don't think you could refute. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 22, says, says, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Can it be any more clear? When we say that we believe that the word of God, that the King James Bible, is inspired and preserved, that's where we get it from. This verse right here, it says, It liveth and abideth forever. There's your inspiration. It liveth, and it also abideth forever. Right? But also, notice that in the last verse there, it says, And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. If you do not have this word, the gospel is not going to have power. If you went up, and let's say you're saved, you know you're going to heaven, and you just explain the gospel to somebody, they will not get saved unless you quote them a verse. Period. And this is becoming like, like a hard saying nowadays. Like I say that, and, and, and there may be preachers out there, there may be, there may be people even that listen to me that be like, oh, no, that, that's not right. You know, they can just get saved off testimony. That's garbage. That's not what the Bible teaches. And it's about time, you know, we need to stand up for this. Because, and I'm not saying like, you know, the people that I look up to as far as friends that I have, like Pastor Anderson, Pastor Jimenez, Pastor uh, uh, David Bersons, yea, Pastor Huggins, who sent me out, believes this. This is not new. This is not like I'm just bringing this up. I'm just trying to be a little extra hard. This is what it used to be taught. And this is something that we need to hold into. And you say, well, this is, very, this is a very basic sermon. Yeah, well, we need to keep the basics hard. We need to keep them tight. Don't let these things go. Listen, I'm going to preach on end times tonight or this afternoon. We're going to get into the fun stuff too. But listen, my sermon this, e this afternoon it's an important sermon. Listen, if I'm preaching a sermon, I believe it's important. But listen, if someone comes in here and they're pre-trib rapture, but they're out soul winning, they believe the Bible's perfect, they believe in uh, once saved, always saved, amen, come on in. You can disagree with me all day all, all, on that. And, and listen, if, you, if, if they disagree with me on that until the day they die and they're here for 50 years and they believe the pre-trib rapture, I don't care, right? That's fine. But this is a major issue. This is heaven and hell. This is, you know, are you, are you preaching the gospel in vain? Because if you go out without the word of God, you're not going to get people saved. You're going to have false conversions. You're going to have false, you know, people are going to pray maybe every once in a while. But they're not going to get saved unless they hear the voice of the shepherd. And to take the word of God out of the gospel, you might as well just say, take Jesus out of the gospel. That's how I view it. Now, John, go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 is where Jesus says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Now, where did that quote where it says that uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, that was talking about the fact that, you know, you're eating bread, you're eating manna, but that, what did that picture? The word of God, Jesus. He said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. Remember, they choked on it. They're like, can we eat your flesh and drink your blood? And he said, hey, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. 
I love how Jesus always just turns it back around on them. You know, they think they got him. They're trying to like, and he throws that at them, and they're just like, oh, good night. Uh, but John chapter 6 and verse 63, notice what it says. So when he's saying this, and they're, you know, they're saying, should we eat your flesh and drink your blood? This is what he meant. In verse 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. They are life. If you want eternal life, then you need to have the word of God. And so don't go out soul winning and, and just like, if you're going to curtail anything in your soul winning, don't let it be the word of God. Okay? Let it be some illustration. Okay? You say, my soul winning is getting a little long. Then cut out, you know, some other things, you know, but don't cut out the word of God. Now, listen, I'm not saying that you need to just, like, give them the whole gospel of John when you're out there. Okay? Listen, I believe someone can get saved off John 3.16. I, I believe that, that that verse right there is powerful enough to get someone saved. Now, is someone going to usually get saved off that one verse? Probably not, because they need to hear other things. They need, you know, and it's one of those things where I'm not going to play that game to see if I can just win somebody with one verse. It, I believe it's possible. But why play that game? Why not just give them a bunch of, of verses, and then there's no doubt, like, at least they, they've, they've heard enough Bible to where they don't have an excuse. But I want to show you, you know, why, why is this a big issue with the King James and these other versions? Okay, Go to Matthew chapter 17. I'm going to show you, first of all, all the verses that are missing from the NIV, ESV, NLT. Yay, I, I have the, the oldest new version at home. I didn't bring it with me, but it's the revised version. It was back in the 1800s. Uh, I think my mom found it like in an antique store or something like that. But, but it, what was interesting about that is the fact that those things... Those same things that are missing in these new NIVs and all that stuff is the same thing that was back in the 1800s when that first new version came out. Why? Because they're using the same text, the same Greek text. And so uh, I'm going to plow through these, but I want you to see. Actually, go, go, to, go to Matthew chapter. Well, you're in 17, verse 21. It says, these are all missing, meaning that you will not find them in the NIV. And if you do find them, it'll be a footnote down below. And it says in verse 21, Howbeit this, ki- this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. Go on. Matthew 18, verse 11. And for sake of time, you can go to this one, but I'm just going to start reading these. Okay, if you want the list later, I'll give it to you. Matthew 18, verse 11. It says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Man, that, that's not important. We'll just take that one out. Matthew 23, verse 14. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses for pretense, make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Gone. Mark 7, 16. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Gone. Mark 9, 44 and 46, same verse, you know, it's just repeated. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Gone. Mark eleven twenty six. But if ye do not forgive, neither will your father... For, uh, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. Go on. Mark 15, 28. And the scripture was fulfilled, which said, and he was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors. Go on. Luke 17, 36. Two men shall be in, in the field. The one shall be taken, the other left. Go on. John 5, th- uh, 3 and 4. In, the, in these, I'm sorry, in these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, a blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. Gone. Acts 8, 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Gone. Acts, 8, or Acts 15, verse 34. Notwithstanding it, please Silas to abide there still. Acts 24, 6 through 8. Who also hath gone at, about to profane the temple, and whom we took, and would have judged according to our law. But the chief captain, Lysias, came upon us, and with great violence took him away out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come unto thee, by examining of whom thyself mayest take knowledge of all these things whereof we accused him. Gone. All three verses. Gone. Acts 28, verse 29. And when he had said these words, the, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. Gone. Romans 16, 24. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Gone. And 1 John 5, 7, one of the most famous ones they take out. 
For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Gone. So tell me again that these versions are not corrupt. Now, I didn't even get into what they perverted yet. That's just what they took out. Now, these are just the ones they blatantly took out. Other places in these versions, they'll have big footnotes that say, you know, this wasn't in the originals, and they just put it in there anyway. Half of Math, or Mark chapter 16, the last chapter, gone. But they put it in there because it would be a big deal if you were reading through there and half that, that chapter was gone. And in other places, like the end of one chapter and the, and the beginning of the other chapter, they don't mention to you that where they got these critical texts from, that they were missing whole books of the Bible. Like Revelation. So, these are corrupt versions. They took away from God's Word. So, you're going to tell me you're going to take that and go out and win someone to Christ? Listen, God's not the author of confusion. And so he's not going to make it confusing as far as which Bible to use. It's not confusing. The King James Bible is the best-selling book ever. You heard me right. Not the best-selling Bible. The best-selling book ever. So tell me again that, you know, which one should we use? Okay. But go to Revelation chapter 22 because God puts a big condemnation on this. Revelation 22 Revelation 22 and verse 18, it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It says that if you take away from his word, he'll, he'll blot you out of the book of life is what that's saying. You'll be reprobate. Now, obviously, only unsaved people can do this. I don't believe a saved person. Now, you say, well, I, I forgot to say this word when I was quoting it. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking away from the word of God. We're not talking about the fact that you were writing it down and you miswrote it or whatever, okay? We're not talking about mistakes. They purposely took these things out. They made footnotes about it. It's not like this was an accident. When you have a footnote of saying why you took it out, that's not an accident, Okay? These people that wrote the NIV, that wrote the ESV, that wrote all these things, if they're still alive, they're damned. And if they're not alive, then they're in hell right now. And so uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 talks about people perverting the word of God and God putting that judgment on it. Uh, for sake of time, you don't necessarily have to turn there, but you can. Uh, Jeremiah 23 in verse 36, it says, and, and the burden of the Lord shall, shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. And notice that verse 39, it says, Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you and will forsake you in the city that I gave you and your fathers and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you and a perpetual shame which shall not be forgotten. That's what he said to these people that were perverting the words of God. And again, I've kind of just showed you where it, it, it's changed, where they took it, the verses out. That's obviously perverting it, right? When you take out something, like, like Acts uh, 8.37, that's where they, they try to justify baby baptism. Because according to that verse, you have to be a believer to get baptized. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And what did, what did, what did the Ethiopian eunuch say? I believe that Jesus... Christ is the Son of God. So that's why he got baptized, right? We don't believe in infant baptism. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, note, you, this is another thing to think about too, is that people have been trying to corrupt the word of God since the world began. Satan tried to do it in the Garden of Eden. He said, yea, hath God said? And so he put a question mark on God's statements. And he questioned the word of God. He was corrupting the word of God from the very beginning, and it hasn't changed but in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17, it says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, and in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. You know what he's saying there is that there's many that do corrupt the word of God. That's why when you go back to uh, the Latin Vulgate, which was Jerome, St. Jerome, right? There's, it's been corrupted. That's why Erasmus, and, uh, when he did his editions in the 1500s, he did his editions of the, the, the Greek texts, 
He paralleled it with the Latin Vulgate for the sole purpose of showing that there were corruptions in it. Okay? And so this been, they've been corrupting the Word of God since the very beginning of time. They were doing it in Jesus' day. They were doing it in Moses' day. They were doing it, yea, in Adam's day. Okay? So just know that people are constantly trying to corrupt the Word of God. That doesn't mean that that negates the fact that he preserved it, right? Because if his word is preserved throughout time and then there's all these other counterfeits, it doesn't mean that it isn't preserved. It just means that Satan's trying to throw these counterfeits out there for people to bite at, right? And so uh, let me show you one of the biggest ones. Go to Isaiah 14. I'm going to show you where the NIV says that, that Jesus is going to fall from heaven. And then... Maybe think about like whether these versions are... Well, usually when I show this to people, listen, if I show this to, to pastors of churches that aren't King James only, they'll brush this off, they'll explain it away. I've never had someone that, that was saved that I showed this to that didn't say, why in the world has not, someone not shown me this? You know, it's just kind of like, what in the world? You know, when I show them all these things that are missing and I show them the stuff that's being corrupted, and listen, I don't have time to show you all the places they take out the blood, they take out the word hell... They take out all this stuff, and they just t they, they take out stuff from verses, okay? But uh, Isaiah 14, verse 12, this is a very famous verse. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Now, who's Lucifer, my friends? Does that sound like Jesus? So, Lucifer, this is the only place that Lucifer's ever mentioned, that name Lucifer. If you ran up to anybody on the street and you said, who's Lucifer? Who are they going to say that is? The devil, right? Now, what, what I want you to see here, go to Revelation chapter 22. What, what, and then I'll read uh, the NIV's version of Isaiah 14, 12. So Revelation 22, 16, it's going to state different things about Jesus and who he is. There's going to be no doubt that we're talking about Jesus in this, by the way, because it says, I, Jesus. <laughs> okay, so that's how this verse starts off. I don't think there's any doubt that, that this is talking about Jesus. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto, the, unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, and the bright and morning star. So who's the morning star? According to Revelation chapter 22, and verse 16. Jesus. I don't, think anybody, I don't think anybody could doubt that, right? This is probably the only verse where I've seen where it says, I, Jesus, say this unto you, right? Um, and there may be other ones, but this is one that's very, like, just out in my mind. I think about it. But in the NIV, mind you, Jesus is the morning star. This is what the NIV says in Isaiah 14, 12. How, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cut, cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. That's even hard. It's hard to read. Sorry, the NIV, these, these versions are horrible. But it says that the morning star is falling from heaven. The morning star, and it doesn't say hell. You know, you may cast down to hell. It says like the, the, the dwelling of the dead. You know, they got to soften everything. But all I have to say is that in the NIV, it says that the morning star, Jesus Christ, is falling from heaven. That's a big problem. You say, well, they're just taking out the these and the thous. No. Now, when you say that Jesus is falling from heaven and being cast into hell because he was trying to be like the Most High, he, he's not trying to be like the Most High. He is the, the Most High. He's the Son of the living God. He's the part of the Trinity. He's the Word where it says, it, oh, they took this out, by the way, you know, that for there are three to bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I wonder why they took that out, right? Well, it just wasn't, it wasn't in ours. Uh, the New King James, by the way, I was looking up this, the New King James, uh, they must have ratified their New King James because in Luke 2, it would say that Joseph was Jesus' father. That was like the big thing you would point to in, in New King James. They since put back in that it says Joseph and his mother instead of his father and mother, but they have it in a footnote now, Okay. But the New King James in Matthew 7, 14 says this. It says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, is salvation difficult? You know, it talks about the, the, 
narrow is the gate and straight is, you know, or I said uh, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. So narrow and straight are synonyms, by the way. Not straight like not crooked, but straight like the straights of Gibraltar, you know, like something that's narrow, confined, right? And so it's just a synonym. And so here it says that salvation is difficult. In 1 Corinthians 1 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That's the New King James where it says, Unto us which are saved in the King James. So it makes salvation a process in the New King James. And so there's many others that you can get into. And listen, I can go, you know, James White and, and like these, these critics. This is how they, they do, their, their, they do these, these versions. They have this corrupt text, first of all, that they have. But they also, the corrupt texts don't agree with each other. This is what it means to be a critical, like they're like critical texts. If in, in let's, say, let's say four different manuscripts, it says like uh, the Lord or it says something that makes sense, right? That would make perfect sense with the rest of the Bible, all that stuff. And then there's one copy that says something completely ridiculous or something that's off the wall. They'll go with the off the wall. The reason why they say it is because, well, the people that were copying down these things, you know, human nature is you're going to try to fix it. You know, if you think that it's off the wall, you're going to try to fix it. So therefore, the off the wall one is probably the right one. That's what you're dealing with with these people. So sometimes they will say something completely crazy, and it's not even in most their Greek text. That's just their critical thinking, right? Just backwards thinking. So let me end with this. The Bible, the, uh, it's very clear that, that, that God said he preserve his word. At that point, you have to say, where is it? Is it in, if it's in, only in the Greek and Hebrew, then you better start learning Greek and Hebrew. You better go get your study books. You better go get your Pimsleur stuff. You better get your Duo, Duolingo app out and start learning those languages to live by every word of God. Or do you believe that God can put it in any language? Because then now you, gotta, now you can find it in different languages. And by the way... The, what language has been evangelizing the world for the past 400 years is English. So I believe the proof's in the pudding. Show me a mistake in this Bible. I dare you to show me a mistake in this Bible. I've been asking people when we go out soul winning for years, show me the contradiction in this Bible. And most of the time it's like they don't understand English grammar and it's, it's easy to be, you know, to, to refute and all that stuff. But go to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to end with this. Because here's the thing. You can say, well, we had, the ki- we had the perfect word of God. It's the King James Bible. You come out of the sermon and be like, yes, I agree with you. It's perfect. It's inerrant. We have it today. You need it to get saved. But if that's all you leave with, then that's not going to be profitable. What you have to leave with is the fact that you need to use it. You need to use it. Because if it's on your shelf at home and you believe it with all, every ounce in your body that it's perfect and preserved, that's not going to help anybody. If you're not reading it, then what's the point? This whole sermon doesn't mean anything then. It doesn't matter. Because you're not reading it. Don't just put it on the shelf. The, uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, Do all things without murmurings and disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And let me say this, you will not be running in vain or laboring in vain if you're holding the King James Bible, preaching the gospel, reading it, using it to raise your children, going through life, you will not run in vain, you will not labor in vain with the King James Bible. And listen, I'm not, I, I'm not interested in them fixing anything in it. There's nothing to be fixed. I'm not is, interested in them modernizing anything in it. What's wrong with it? If it's not broke, don't fix it. Now, if the whole world just goes out of English and we all start speaking some other language, then yeah, it's about we need to get another language. We need to get another translation. But until that happens, just read the King James Bible. Stop messing with it. Stop trying to fix it. Stop, stop bringing out these new versions. We have the whole word of God, but what are you doing with it? We're going to go out soul winning this afternoon. It's a beautiful day. We're going to go out soul winning. We're going to give people the gospel and, you know, some people may get saved, but it's not going to be without the Word of God. And if we don't go, it's not going to happen. So we need to, to some, some of these sermons are just like good things to know, and you're just kind of like building on that foundation.
But you need, we need a good kick in the pants every once in a while to say, hey, you know what? I have the King James. Have I read it this week? Have I memorized anything this week? Have I won anybody to Christ this week? Because if I haven't, then it's, 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 being, it's sitting there in vain. You know, let's use it. Let's, let's, let's labor with the gospel and with the word of God in our hands. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. And pray that you'd be with us as we uh, go out soul winning later on, but also in just the, the church service that will follow that. And Lord, just pray that you'd, uh, again, meet with us and, and with the fellowship that, that it comes after. And Lord, help us not take for granted uh, your word that you provided for us. Help us to use it. Help us to read it. Help us to memorize it. And Lord, we love you and pray all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.